Now an introduction. So at our church, something's been going on. And uh, one of the things that's been going on is that a bunch of us have have gotten involved with World Vision and doing this like marathon stuff and the Century Bike Ride stuff to raise money to put water in the DR Congo. And so I'm at church last year and, and I'm listening to the presentation. And I'm telling you, this guy's so fired up. Like, I'm getting fired up. And I'm like, my wife's out doing some other holy duty uh, uh, during this part of the meeting. And this guy says, come forward and sign up to run the marathon if you want to do this. And I'm, I ran up and I signed up Jamie and myself. <laughs> and so in the car on the way home, I was like, so um, <clears throat> I kind of signed us up to run a marathon for Team World Vision. Is that awesome or what? She's like, what are you talking? Dude, you can't run a marathon. You've had four knee surgeries. It's like, okay, so that's a fair point. That's a fair point. So we, so we came up with a wild idea of how to ride 100 miles for the same cause and then went and cheered on over 100 of our folks from our church that were running either a half or a full marathon for this unbelievable, beautiful, literally life-changing cause. And so I have some friends here from Team World Vision, some that I go to church with, uh, and our Westmont alum like Brian Hammond's here, and then Rich Rell is here. I saw Rich somewhere. There he is. He's really good looking. That guy is enthusiastic. Okay, he, he he brings his own coffee. So, uh, but today we have Michael <laughs> Michael Chilton here is going to speak to us. This guy runs big time, and he's he actually helps start this whole Team World Vision thing around the world. One idea that has led to lots and lots and lots of actual change around the world. And he has his own guest that he's going to introduce to to us. But I don't want to take any more of his time. Please. Help me introduce and welcome Michael Chitwood. Well, thanks so much, Scott. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you all to share a bit of my story. Uh, my brother David died in my mom's basement alone nine years ago. He was 37 years old. He died of alcoholism, obesity, and depression. But I believe the real cause of his death was the fact that there were not enough Jesus followers willing to enter into his pain in a real and an authentic way. And I count myself among those people. I want to talk to you today about pain. It's not an easy or fun subject, but I believe that how we respond to the pain of others is perhaps the single most important question we can answer for ourselves as Christians. We are all hardwired to avoid pain at all costs. We avoid our own pain and we avoid being near the pain of others. In fact, the ability to see the potential for, a pain, for pain, to see a few steps down the road and avoid pain, if and when we can, is kind of second nature for us. But the truth is, pain is inevitable. It is unavoidable. Now, funny enough, I actually made it through about the first 25 years of my life pretty much pain-free. I grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is about as much in a bubble as you can get. It was a pretty safe uh, childhood. I had two older brothers, Dan and Dave, who were my heroes, two parents that loved me. I went to an incredible school, had a lot of friends, great church family. To be honest, life was pretty easy for me as a kid. Uh, my first job after college was actually teaching fifth grade in a school very different from the one I grew up in, about an hour south of Chicago. About 98% of the students in my class came from low-income families. It was my first real experience even witnessing poverty. It was after my second year as a teacher that I went on my first trip to a developing country. I went with my dad to Haiti to train some elementary school teachers there. And I'll never forget the first two words I learned in Haitian Creole, mwe. Grangu, mwe grangu. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Young kids would run alongside the vehicles we were in and they'd say those words over and over again. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Now, I'd seen poverty at this point. The first homeless person I met was a 10 year old girl in the class I taught. But I'd never seen anything like this. Kids with literally no food to eat, no safe water to drink, and often no shelter over their heads. It absolutely wrecked me and I came back from Haiti with an application to be a teacher there but I was getting married the next summer and everyone told me that moving to Haiti as newlyweds was a terrible idea. That it wasn't safe. 
So despite a deep desire to do something to help those kids, I froze. I chickened out and I let fear get the best of me. Instead, I took a full-time job doing youth ministry with Youth for Christ, working with high school students through a program called Campus Life. And my time at Youth for Christ was amazing, but I knew deep in my soul I had ignored a whisper from the Holy Spirit to do something to help those kids. Well, it was during my first year of ministry at Youth for Christ that I had my first real personal experience with pain. My dad went in for what was supposed to be a routine shoulder surgery, and something went wrong and he slipped into a coma. And he passed away three days later in the hospital. I was 25 years old in my first year of marriage, my first year of full-time ministry with Youth for Christ. And it absolutely shattered my faith. I was having a hard time even talking to God. Well, it was two years after losing my dad, almost to the day that I got a phone call from a high school friend of mine, Mark Smith. He was calling to tell me he was going to run the Chicago Marathon, and he asked if I would come watch him run. Now, notice Mark did not ask me to run the marathon with him. I was an unlikely candidate. I was a former college defensive lineman on the football team. By this time, I weighed 265 pounds, and I couldn't run around the block. But when Mark told me he was running the marathon, I heard a whisper that I believe was the Holy Spirit, and it was just two words. Do this. So despite the fact that I hated running and I'd never even run a 5K, I signed up for and trained for my first marathon. Now, over the next six months, I trained very slowly. Now, if you think about how slow you can make yourself run, I was slower than that. My friends would say, hey, Chewit, I thought you were training to run that Chicago Marathon. I'd say, I am, thanks for asking. And they'd say, oh, I keep seeing you walking all over the place. <laughs> I was pretty slow, but something amazing happened out on those long, slow runs. I started talking to God again. To be honest, sometimes I was yelling at him. I was hurt and angry, and I figured he had it coming. Sometimes I would just pull over to the side of the road and start weeping. And sometimes I was just listening to him. And then on October 15th, 2003, I told the start line of my first race ever, the Chicago Marathon. I remember so clearly walking to the starting line. The streets of Chicago all shut down. A million spectators packed into downtown Chicago. Music blasting and 35,000 people all ready to run 26.2 miles. We had one small problem. My buddy Mark and I had never discussed a race day strategy. He had trained to run nine minutes per mile and I had trained just to finish before they shut the course down. So we decided we were going to split the difference somewhere in the middle. That was a great idea for Mark, but it was a terrible idea for me. That race did not go very well. In fact, it's probably still to date one of the most painful things I've ever done. But it changed my life physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And I decided that day I would do a race like this every year for the rest of my life. So when I heard about the Ironman Triathlon, I knew I had to do it. Now, if you don't know what the Ironman is, it's a 2.4 mile open water swim. You get out of the water, you hop on a bike, you ride 112 miles, and then if you can still stand up, you tie up your shoes and you run 26.2 miles. When I signed up, I didn't know how to swim and I didn't own a bike. <laughs> no one ever accused me of being the smartest guy in a room. <laughs> but I've seen what fear can do to you. Fear kept me from moving to Haiti despite feeling a call on my heart. Fear almost made me quit training for my first marathon. In fact, I've come to believe that almost every amazing thing God has for us in this life is on the other side of fear. And you have to step through fear to get to it. Well, one day, as I was training for the Ironman, I was out on a five-hour bike ride in the cornfields of central Illinois when I had what I can only describe as a discussion with God, a conversation. It went sort of like this. Michael, you could do these races and help those kids, kids like the ones you met in Haiti. And my mind started racing and I started thinking about all the charities I'd seen at the races I'd been doing. Red and blue and purple jerseys, all these folks raising money for charity, but I couldn't think of a single one that was raising money for the poorest communities on the planet. And I knew immediately that this is what God was calling me to do. And through the grace of God, I found myself meeting with some folks from World Vision, sharing the vision God had given me, and four months later, I became the first Team World Vision staff person. We started Team World Vision as a way to invite people, 
people who hate running, people who've never done anything athletic in their lives, to step through fear and take on the challenge of a half marathon or a marathon and raise money for clean water projects in Africa. That first year in 2006, we had 100 folks take on the Chicago Marathon, but since then, we've helped 50,000 people cross finish lines, and we've raised $50 million for clean water projects in Africa. The, uh, You know, I have had a front row seat to see God change lives here through the folks that are taking on these challenges and I've traveled to Africa 17 times to see the incredible life-changing work we're raising money for. But I've had even more heartbreaks along the way. When my dad died, one of the toughest realizations I had was that the longer I live, the more pain and heartache I have in store for me, that there was more to come. Well, it was just eight years after my dad died that we lost my brother David. Now, David had already been struggling with obesity and alcoholism, but the loss of my dad beat him down and beat him down until he wound up spending most of his days alone in my mom's basement where his battle with alcoholism, depression, and his weight finally took his life. He was 37 years old when he died and he left behind four young kids without their dad and his young wife widowed at 32. And then, just as I was catching my breath and getting on my feet, back in 2013, we lost my brother Dan. No real explanation what happened. He went upstairs to get ready for his daughter's eighth grade basketball game and he never came down. Dan was a pastor, a father. He had four kids. He left without their dad. Young wife widowed. And as if losing my dad wasn't enough, Losing both of my brothers absolutely broke my mom's heart. And losing my two best friends crushed my spirit. A few months after my brother Dan died, I came across a Bible verse that has completely rocked my worldview. It's Psalm 34, 18, and it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I've learned the hard way that there is more pain and heartache in this life for me than I ever imagined possible. But here's the deal with pain. Either you've already experienced the type of pain that I'm talking about, or maybe you're in the midst of the most painful experience of your life right now, or at some point, you will be. Pain is inevitable. If you look at our heroes in the Bible, they did not live lives of ease and comfort, but their spiritual journeys were forged through times of pain and trial and heartache. And I believe that's where yours and mine are formed also. So what does Psalm 34, 18 have to say to me when I'm facing pain? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. It says that when I am brokenhearted, the Lord is close to me, even when it doesn't feel like he is. And when my spirit is crushed, he can rescue me. But you know, it's easy to get caught up in our own pain, to be so focused on ourselves that we can forget there are other hurting people in the world. When I was a kid, if I wasn't getting my own way, I'd often say, that's just not fair. And my parents would lightheartedly say, well, guess what, Michael? Life's not fair. They were joking, but there's a lot of truth in that statement. Life isn't fair. Well, after my dad died, I would say that to God all the time. God, this isn't fair. And one time I made the mistake of saying it out loud in front of my mom. And my mom gently reminded me of others in this world who've truly experienced the unfairness of this life. She reminded me that there are millions of refugees right now fleeing their homes in search of safety and they're not going to find any. She reminded me that there are kids that are going to die today because they don't have enough food to eat or safe water to drink. She reminded me that there are more people trapped in slavery in 2018 than at any point in human history. That there are children being forced to fight in wars and there are 10 and 11 year old girls being forced into marriages with 30 and 40 year old men. And now when I think about that question, it makes me think of a little girl in Kenya named Maureen. Maureen is the little girl my wife and I sponsor through World Vision, and she was just three years old the first time we met her. In her 
community that had literally no access to safe water. They had to walk down a mountain a few miles every day to get water that wasn't even safe to drink. In fact, the child mortality rate in Maureen's community was 50%. That means Maureen only had a 50% chance of living to see her fifth birthday. Maureen has fears and worries and pain and things she's faced that I will never have to worry about. What does Psalm 34:18 have to say to kids like Maureen? The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. It says when they are brokenhearted, the Lord is close to them. Even when it doesn't feel like he is. A couple of years before my dad died, my brother Dan gave him a journal. And in it he answered this epic question. What is the spiritual legacy you'd like to leave for others? Here's my dad's response, written on his way home from an amputee camp in Sierra Leone, Africa, where victims of the Civil War were being fitted with makeshift prosthetic limbs. Several pages in this book were written on my Sierra Leone trip. This is my last one on the way home. As I sit here in a first-class seat and think back of the people on the streets of Freetown, the poverty now that I've seen in Haiti, Nicaragua, and Freetown has forever changed my life. The absolute luxury we enjoy in America it's hard to enjoy once you've seen our fellow man living in poverty, not knowing if they will have a next meal or when they will have a meal. What spiritual legacy do I want to leave? Only that we will remember the poor and do what we can to relieve their suffering. Friends, there is often very little we can do about our own pain. But there is always something we can do to help relieve the pain of others. And if we truly want to be close to God, we need to go where God is. And if God is close to the brokenhearted, you and I are called to be close to the brokenhearted. I shared just a minute ago about my World Vision sponsor child, Maureen. We've been sponsoring Maureen for eight years now, and I've had the chance to see everything in her community change. And if I could, I would tell you right now that we're all going to go outside, get on a private jet, and fly to Kenya to meet Maureen. But the truth is, I don't have that kind of money. So we did the next best thing. Would you help me welcome my sponsor child, Maureen, to the stage? Can we all try and say hello in Swahili? We say Jambo. Jambo. Oh, one more time. Jambo. Jambo. All right. Well, it is such a privilege to have Maureen, her brother Justin, and my World Vision Kenya colleague Hannah with us for a few minutes. Um, Maureen, can you tell us, how old are you now? I am 11 years old. 11 years old. And Maureen's actually just finished fourth grade. She had to miss a little bit of school uh, from having malaria a couple of years ago, but she's doing awesome in school. Maureen, can you tell me, what are the names of your brothers and sisters? Justin, Shadrach, Chapet, Elias, Aston, Melissa, Jacqueline, me, and mom. You and mom. And who's this one over here? Justin. Justin. So Justin's the oldest of all the siblings. I remember very clearly the first time I came to Bartabwa, Kenya to meet Maureen and Justin and their family. Maureen was just three years old and the whole community had gathered. We were the first Americans to come to this community and I sat on the ground with this tiny little version of Maureen and went to their home and had a meal. And I remember I gave Maureen a stuffed animal and she started weeping, crying her eyes out. And the whole family started laughing. She thought I had handed her a dead animal. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, she knows what stuffed animals are now. <laughs> so the, um, Justin was actually a boy in Bartaba before World Vision came and the project started happening. Justin, would you share a little bit what it was like for you to go fetch water as a young boy? Thank you so much, Michael. Um, before World Vision came in, uh, life was so challenging, so challenging. At least for you guys, you are lucky, you, 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 have, you have auctions here, you have even a snow, <laughs> something we don't have in Kenya. Before World Vision came in, uh, we used to travel for more than eight kilometers to get water. And the water we, 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 we got was not even clean. So at the end of the day, uh, most kids, the mortality rate at that time was very high because of typhoid and other waterborne diseases 
that consume the more lives than now. So, and another thing that as I was growing up, I used to miss school because I have to travel for long distance, or if I don't miss schools, uh, because of waking up at very early in the morning at nine, at, at 3 a.m., at the, during the day, you cannot listen to concentrate to class because you are so sleepy. At, at the end of the uh, term or semester, you, you, you end up failing. So life was so challenging. Yeah. Enrollment in school was very low also. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of folks, um, I know I didn't growing up, know that lack of safe water is the number one preventable cause of death on planet Earth. It kills more people in Africa than AIDS and malaria combined. It kills more people on the planet than all the wars and violence put together. But we know the solution to clean water. In fact, World Vision is now the leading non-government organization providing clean water in the developing world. And when you bring clean water to a community, as Justin was saying, it actually cuts child mortality in half, and school enrollment can as much as triple. And that's actually exactly what happened in, in Justin and Maureen's community. The, the school enrollment tripled when they gained access to safe water. And um, Maureen, how far now do you have to walk to get clean water? Outside our house. Out, right outside your house, yep. Oh, this is Maureen. That's their house right there. So where they used to walk kilometers every day, now there's access to safe water right at their home. But World Vision doesn't stop with clean water. Through child sponsorship and other fundraising that we do, what are some, Hannah, what are some of the other programs that World Vision projects that we do in communities like Maureen's? Thank you, Michael. Uh, friends, beside um, the water project Michael has talked about, World Vision does other projects like education projects where we work with vulnerable communities to improve uh, well, the learning environment in school, building uh, classrooms and equipping them. We also work on agricultural projects where we improve the food security in the vulnerable communities because uh, it is a reality in Africa, in Kenya that our children go to bed in empty stomachs. They wake up, go to school we, we are having not eaten, so concentration is very low. We are, so our vision work with the farmers uh, to promote technology so that they can be able to produce food. So that at least, we are aiming at at least children have three meals a day. Uh, we also have work on health projects where we uh, improve child uh, health care to the co vulnerable communities because we have instances where uh, mothers deliver at home, children do not get health care and uh, children do not see their fifth birthdays because of uh, 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 simple diseases that are preventable. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. And Maureen, um, I know you're only 11 years old right now, but when I was 11, I had dreams of what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, do you have some dream of what you'd like to become when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. Wow. I, uh, you know, I have a four-year-old son now, and I believe that, you know, my, my passion is to, that I would turn over heaven and earth so that my son could become anything God calls him to be. And something God's been teaching me about our brothers and sisters around the world is exactly those words, brothers and sisters. In Matthew 25, Jesus actually calls us to view those who the world would consider the least of these as our family, as our brothers and sisters. Because you see, as I can begin to view Justin Maureen as my brother and my sister, my entire worldview will change. Right? My actions will change. I won't just be compelled to care more. I'll be compelled to do more. And I should be compelled to turn over heaven and earth so that Maureen can grow up to live out God's purpose for her life in anything God's calling her to be, the same way I would for my own son. You know, I talked about that each of us is going to experience pain in this life. And if, if you're going through a painful experience right now, I want you to know that God is close to you. And I want to tell you, students, you have classmates right now going through hell on earth and you may not even know about it. They are facing pain the likes of which they don't even know how to explain to you and they might be keeping it inside and not even telling you about it. And you have an opportunity to love on your classmates, your neighbors, community members. But today I also want to invite you to consider that you may be able to take action in some powerful ways to change the lives of children like Maureen. 
One simple way, your school is already sponsoring multiple kids. I think like 14 kids or something. You can see how many of you are already contributing to that. One way to take action would be to contribute to that. Or if you'd like to sponsor a child yourself, we're going to be here all like through lunchtime today up in the dining commons and you can stop by and learn about that. We've got some other cool things that Scott's going to talk to you about. But then the other really amazing way I want to invite you to consider taking action today is I want to invite each and every one of you to consider joining me in running the Los Angeles Marathon this March. I know that sounds a little crazy. Some of you all are like, I hate running. In, in, in football, running was punishment. I was a defensive lineman. If I was running, it's because I got in trouble. I hated running, right? But here's the deal. 80% of the folks who run with Team World Vision have never run in their lives. And let me tell you this. A few years ago, I told our staff, we can't invite college students to run. They're not motivated. They don't care. They're not going to do it. And then I spoke at a college in Illinois and 150 students signed up to run the Chicago Marathon, our biggest team that year. And I am praying and believing that there are people in this room that are feeling a tug on their heart that you could run the LA Marathon with us. You can run the full or the half marathon. No experience necessary. Right after chapel today, right over here on those steps, if you're able to stay, we're going to do a short 10-minute meeting about what that would look like. And if you, if you got class or something, we'll be in the dining commons after your class. But I would love to invite you. I'm going to run this year in Los Angeles. I live in Chicago, but I'm coming to run LA with you all. And I would love to see Westmont College put out the biggest Team World Vision team we've ever had in LA. Thank you so much for inviting us, letting us share our stories. Thank you for showing love. Maureen and Justin and Hannah will be with us through lunchtime too. You get to give hugs or take pictures with them or, or give them your love too. Uh, we just appreciate you all and can't wait to see what God's going to do. Please join me after service if you're able. Thanks so much. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Did you hear the air leave the room as soon as Michael said, would you consider running the LA Marathon? <laughs> but seriously, just sit in that for a second. You know, Michael heard that do this. I wonder if anybody else has heard that do this. You know, your life changes when you do something bigger than yourself. It just does. How many of you know the prophet Bono? Right? <laughs> the prophet Bono says, where you live should not determine whether you live or die. The founder of uh, World Vision, Bob Pierce, is famous for praying, Lord, break my heart with the things that break the heart of God. That's what we most want to develop in you, Westmont, is minds and hearts that are in tune with the kingdom of God, broken with the things that break the heart of God, and wills that engage in entering into the work. You know, that Jesus was asked, what's the greatest thing? What's the most important thing? And what did he say? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Strength means we bring something of ourselves, whatever we have to offer, and say, take this and see where it goes. And so I want you to sit in that really awkward, terrible question. Maybe some of you are supposed to be gearing up for the biggest run of your life, to give life. You know, in a year of chapels, I'm sure we're going to hear different things going on in the world, different opportunities, different things wrong with the world. And sometimes the paralysis of knowing as much information as we have leads us to say, what can I do? I can't do everything. You can't. You cannot do everything. But all of us are supposed to enter in to do something. Scripture is clear about saying that we have been, that there have been, we've been created for good works ahead of time. Maybe this is one you're supposed to step into. So if right after chapel, if you don't have class and you got that little freaky twinge thing going on right now, come over here. They're going to take all these seats out of here, by the way. So come over here and listen.
and, and talk to these uh, folks. People in bright orange jerseys have things to say to you. And if you do have to go to lunch or class, then at uh, the Dining Commons, really until like 2 o'clock, the Team World Vision is going to be up there. They're also going to be up there with these like cool VR glasses or whatever those things are. And you're going to see what it's like to take a journey to walk for water. So that's going to happen. Now, Madison is going to come up and pray for the uh, DR Congo. Uh, Madison, I believe it's her grandmother, has a mission there. Is that right, Madison? Yeah. So we thought, hey, great, let's pray for the Congo today. Come on up. Okay. Hello. So if you all would bow your heads and pray with me. Father, I thank you so much for your heart for the Congo. God, and I thank you that you are present there. Father, we pray for peace over the Congo, and we thank you that peace is not the absence of something, but it's the presence of someone, and that someone is you, and you are ever present in the Congo. And Father, I pray that you would instill in the hearts of each of these students here a little piece of who you've created them to be, and maybe just a piece of that is getting to work with World Vision, or even starting to run this marathon, Father. I pray that you would enter into the hearts of each student here, that they would know that they are a part of something bigger than themselves, and that you would slowly reveal to them just little bits of what that might be. Father, we thank you for your love and for your presence every day. We pray for the Congo especially, that you would continue to do the work that you're doing and that every single heart in the Congo, every person would see you move and that they, that little piece would be something that they cannot deny that you are alive and that you are working. Amen.